Hello, everyone. We're going to get started here in a minute. I, I see a few of you have already jumped in. You guys can hear me okay? Last night, we were having a little bit of a sound issue. But it looks like I see... It looks like the microphone is working. All right. Well, we'll officially wait until 9 o'clock to get started. <clears throat> A friend of mine just traveled to Iceland and brought me back some uh, a set of glasses. I think there were three of them. Drink like a Viking. And no, this is not uh, any type of alcoholic beverage. This is uh, ginger ale, as I often drink in class. <clears throat> the house that I currently own heats with a corn stove. You actually load dried corn into it. And the only kind of downfall with it is that it really kind of dries out the house. So I often have to wet my whistle. <laughs> All right. Well, it says on my clock, nine o'clock. So I'm going to get started. Um, as I posted on Google Classroom, I'm going to try every night to do a little bit of reading, some of my favorite books about American history. And uh, I'll also talk about the current events that are taking place in our country today, as we would talk about in class at times. I'll try to tie back what I read to everybody to things that we've talked about in class as well. Um, so I've got our, our first book here, and I've got a whole, whoops, a whole list of good current events to talk about. Uh, this book that I'm going to start with tonight is called April Morning uh, by one of my favorite uh, authors, Howard Fast. He writes historical fiction. And this is a book about a, it's either a 15 or 16 year old boy who is trapped or finds himself trapped and wrapped up in the Battle of Lexington and Concord, which is the first Battle of the American Revolution. Uh, one of the reasons that I thought it might be a good book to read to everyone uh, is that, you know, certainly this young man is in a world that he never thought he'd be in at his age. And I think that many of you probably are thinking to yourselves, how the heck did this happen to me? I'm 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. I'm in high school. I'm supposed to be having fun and doing all this good, cool stuff in my youth. And now the world seems to be a little topsy-turvy. Uh, we'll get through it, my friends. We absolutely will. So let me do a little reading to you, and then we'll, we'll talk some current events. Again, April Morning by Howard Fast. When I turned back to the house, my father called after me, and asked me, did I figure that I was finished? I figure so, I said. And then my father said, in that way he has of saying something that cuts you down to half your size or less, slow to start and quick to finish. He said it plain and quiet, but it was <clears throat> of a piece, and it reminded me that I couldn't think of a time when he had, had said something pleasing, pleasing, excuse me, or gentle, with love or concern. I replied to him, but not aloud, for which I didn't have the guts at all. If just once in all my born days did you say a good thing to me, then maybe I'd show good to you and be able to do what you want me to do and maybe read your mind or your soul. But aloud, I said nothing, just began to walk toward the house and his voice coiled after me like a whip around my ankle. Adam, yes, sir. I'll have you talk to me face to face, not into the air with your back to me. Yes, sir, I said, turning around. Draw your mother's evening water and bring it to her. 
Wasted steps are like wasted thoughts, just as empty and just as ignorant. Yes, Father, I said, and I went to the house and picked up the yoke and walked with it to the well. The sun was cutting. That is the time of the day when the wind stops, and the air is so sweet, you can taste it and you can suck it. But that afternoon, the time of day made me think about death. I saw a chicken hawk in flight and waited for someone somewhere to send a load of birdshot after it, but no one did. I thought of death and was full of fear. And I just wanted to sit down somewhere and put my face in my hands and give in to the terrible frightened feeling I had, but I didn't. I have all kinds of strange thoughts and feelings of that sort. And I guess I never talked to anyone about them, except perhaps a little to granny because I didn't really believe that anyone in the world ever had just the same kind of thoughts. I think that's pretty common for most teenagers, uh, especially a lot of teenagers today. When I drew the water from the well, I said the spell to take the curse off water. Holy ghost and holy hell, get thee out of this mossy well. My father once heard me say that spell, and he took me into the barn and gave me seven with the birch rod. He hated spells and said they were worse than an instrument of the devil. They were an instrument of ignorance, and I was foolish enough to answer back that if he was so sure about all kinds of superstition, why did, the bir why did he birch me seven times, not eight or six? That was the way it was in the whole town. When you got the rod taken to you, you got it seven times. I should have known enough to keep my mouth shut because he replied that he was gratified to be enlightened and laid on to me 10 times more and then wanted to know whether I deemed 17 to be a superstitious number. So now I said the spell quietly, just moving my lips. A spell has no meaning if you only think it yourself and never voice it. But quiet or not, my brother Levi, who was 11 years old, has cat's eyes. He popped up and demanded a drink from the bucket. Draw your, draw your own water, I said. Don't be high and mighty. I seen you saying the spell. How would you like me to go tell father that I seen you saying the spell? You're a little bastard, I told him. Sure. And what did you just call your mother? All right. Take your drink and leave me be. Why don't you stay out of my sight? I'd be happy to God if only you'd stay out of my sight. I took a drink too. The water is always best, cold and crackling, when you first draw it. When I came into the house, mother was frying donkers, and the kitchen was full of the smell. You save a week's meat, a week's meat leftovers and make donkers, and then it's chopped together with bread and apples and raisins and savory spices and fried and served up with boiled pudding. I don't know anything better. When my mother saw me come in with a yoke, she took the water off and smiled her gratitude. You're a good boy, Adam, she said. I didn't tell her that it wasn't my idea. I needed for someone to think something good about me, and I didn't want to disturb her thinking. When I ate some of the raw meat stuff, she slapped my hand. When I sat down, she said, are you going to stay here and fill my head with your nonsense? What nonsense? I haven't said a word. That's just it, Adam. You sit there with that look in your eyes, and just as plain as daylight, I can see the kind of silly dream you're contemplating. When I was your age, if a boy had an hour between the chores and mealtime, he spent it with profit, reading the holy writ. Granny told me how your father, just about your age it was, set himself a disciplined period to if did he want to memorize the verses of lamentations every evening for, to profit himself. And let me tell you this, Adam, she said, I don't hold with the narrow view of some, but it seems to me that an expression like good heavens is precious close to swearing. It seems to me that the king's English is abundant enough to express every necessary shade of feeling and impatience without resorting to words that have sincere meaning when used properly. Have you been fighting with your brother again? Now, what gave you that idea? I didn't wait for her to tell me, but got up and began to stalk out of the way I had come. She had to know where I was going. 
just to find Granny, she's upstairs. I went upstairs and Granny was in her room making thread. When I entered, she blinked at me and said, I see less and less. Old age is pity enough. But when the eyesight goes, the good Lord is laying a heavy burden on my poor shoulders. Well, Granny, I replied, I don't think your eyesight is going. It's just getting dark in here because the twilight has come down. Is that so, Adam? Sure enough. Well, then, I've spun sufficiently, she declared. Sit down, Adam. Do you want some sweets? I sat down on her old milking stool, which she had decorated with paint and turned into one of the prettiest things in the house, and reminded her that there was a widely held opinion to the effect that sweets before mealtime spoil an appetite. Oh, she said, I'm sure we'd all be richer if I could devise something to spoil your appetite, Adam. Then she went to the cupboard and got out a cotton handkerchief that she always wrapped the maple sugar in. She bro broke off a piece for both of us. I ate it slowly and appreciatively and asked her whether it was true about my father and lamentations. It's true. Well, what for? I mean, what was his purpose? To profit himself, she said. That's what mother said. But I'll be damned if I see the profit in it. You will be damned, Adam, if you go on with such talk, I shrugged. And don't act if you don't care. I think we keep saying things that we don't really mean at all, Granny. Do we? And what sort of things, Adam? Like being damned. Do you believe in God, Granny? What a question, she snorted with great indignation. In all my born days, Adam Cooper, I have never seen a boy like yourself for asking questions. Well, do you? Of course I do. Well, I, I don't know. Adam Cooper, you are not going to start in again with all that silly nonsense of yours, are you? J just one thing. Just answer me one thing, Granny. That's all I'm asking. I just want you to answer me one thing. What is it that they're always taking in, uh, taking it out on me for whenever I say, like there's nothing in the world I can do right and everything I do is all wrong? My goodness, the things you say, Adam. Well, look at it this way, Granny. You believe in God, don't you? Enough of that. If you believe in God, then God gave a person brains, didn't he? Of course. But just soon as you begin to use your brains God gave you, you're being sinful. That's just the sort of foolish thing you say, Adam. That's so provoking. Well, just take Isaiah Peterkin, for example. Oh, no, she said, her eyes narrowing. I am not going to be trapped into that Isaiah Peterkin thing. It just happens that I was gathering blueberries the other day, and there you were down in the gully with Ruth Simmons instructing her about Isaiah Peterkin, and I overheard enough. Did you see us, Granny? I didn't have to see you, as if I wouldn't know that Cooper voice of yours anywhere. I sighed with relief and told her that even if I had gone into a little with Ruth Simmons, that didn't make it any less a fact. It just seems to me, Adam Granny said, that shaking a body loose from her faith is about the most sinful thing you can do. Granny, I wasn't shaking anybody loose from anybody's faith. I'd like you to tell me how old Isaiah can be, at, uh, be as mean and wicked and two-faced as he is, and be a deacon in the church, and be looked up to as a real fine God-fearing man. I mean, he can get away with anything, just so long as he says right, the right words about religion. It's not for you to judge, Isaiah Peterkin. I wasn't judging him, I protested. Everyone knows how rich and mean he is, so how could I be judging him? Anyway, in Boston, when we were there a fortnight past, there was a man talking right on the common, and he said that the highest good was to doubt. Just like that, in those very words. I have never heard such nonsense. If he said that, he was nobody worth quoting. He was a committeeman, Granny. I don't believe a word of it. You cross my heart, Granny. Don't you dare cross your heart to me, she snapped. Just like you was Roman or some other heathen sect. And don't think that because I'm old and rheumatic and grateful for foolish company that you can say anything you please in front of me. 
You can't cozy me with that pretense at stupidity. Not in 1,000 years. You're a spiteful boy, and that's why your father loses patience with you. He doesn't lose patience, Granny. He doesn't have any patience to begin with. There! And this was a committeeman, I said. So, well, just tell me this. Was he a Sam Adams committeeman? I admit that I admitted that he most likely was a Sam Sam Adams committee man. She shrugged her shoulders and she said there wasn't anything else a uh, body could do, seeing that Sam Adams was an atheist, and so were all of his cronies. Granny had a good mind, and I guess that was one of the reasons why I enjoyed provoking her. The other reason was that she would stand for being provoked, and practically no one else would. Now. If, she had say, if he had said, Adam, she went on, that one of the paths to good was a certain amount of doubt and common sense. There might be some reason and common sense. I'm sorry. There might be some reason to his thoughts. Then he would be, he would have been sensible. But doubt is a negative thing and good is a positive thing. And anyone who says that both are the same thing is simply a fool. And there you are. That's it exactly, Granny. When you disagree with someone, you straight out and call them a fool. But when I disagree, I get my ears pinned back. I think that um, this is probably pretty common for a lot of people that you have very odd and tense relationships when you're a teenager with your parent, but you have a very interesting and somewhat loving relationship with a grandparent and myself growing up uh, I oftentimes had uh, pretty bad disputes with my mom and uh, a couple good ones with my dad but my grandmother always seemed to know me just by looking at me I could walk in a room and she could look at my posture or look at the expression on my face and she would know exactly what was going on. And I think Adam and his grandmother are kind of the same way. Uh, where did I leave off? Sorry. Okay. I'm older than you, Adam, by a year or two. You said yourself that age doesn't teach most folks a blessed thing. Don't tell me what I said. If you propose to remain as narrow and as opinionated as you are now, all the years of your life, well, that's your choice. Most, far, most folks are one thing. I should hope that my grandson would be something else. At that moment, mother called from below and supper was ready. I gave granny my arm and helped her down the stairs. Her rheumatism was getting worse and worse. As we went down the staircase, myself a little in front of her because the staircase was so narrow, she said to me, don't ever talk most to me, Adam. Most folks are not Coopers, and most folks do not live in this village or in this country either. Excuse me, county either. Most folks are not dissenters, and most folks will just as soon find a chain and put it around their necks, considering one wasn't there already. Coopers have always been teachers and pastures and free yeoman farmers and ship captains and merchants for 150 years on this soil. I don't recall one of them who couldn't write a sermon and deliver it to, if the need ever arose. Well, maybe you're learning on the first one, Granny. Excuse me. Maybe you're leaning on the first one, Granny. Uh, this is a very old book. This is actually um, from when I was in middle school, so some of the pages are a little smudged and worn. I apologize. Let me have a quick drink here. One of my favorite things to do as a dad was to uh, read to my children. And when they got old enough to the point where they didn't want me to read to them anymore, I really missed it. On weekdays, we ate our meals in the kitchen. On the Sabbath, we ate dinner in the dining room. And mother set the table with china and silver. We weren't rich, but Granny's mother had been rich enough for china and silver. On weekdays, we ate with plainware. Although there were only five of us in the immediate family, our table was always set with places for six. 
mother at one end, father at the other, Granny facing the two boys. The empty chair was next to Granny. My father claimed that it was an empty chair, as he puts it, a manifesto of hospitality, an invitation to anyone who crossed our threshold at meantime. And I must admit that many a guest sat there, knowing that the welcome was ready at the Coopers. The food good and the cooking beyond compare. But my father's real purpose was an audience, and if possible, an argument. There wasn't anyone in his own family who he considered really worth arguing with. And as far as, far as plain discourse was concerned, although we were a disciplined and trained audience, he could never be wholly sure that we were listening, and if listening, comprehending. My own opinion was that Granny could win hands down in any argument, but she would not argue with her son in front of his own children. She also felt that one of her sex tended to be unladylike and pushing when she ventured on the finer points of the divine, the ordinary, and inherent rights of man, which was mainly the subject. Tonight, however, we had no guest at the beginning of the meal, and five of us sat down, and four of us bent our heads while Father said grace. He didn't hold with bending his head at grace or at any other time. And when Granny once raised this point to him, he replied that one of many differences between ourselves and Papists and high church people, who were a shade worse than Papists, was that whereas the latter two sects cringed and groveled before the clay and plaster images they worshipped, we stood face to face with our God as befitting what he had created in his own image. Granny said there was possibly some difference between cringing and groveling and a polite bending of the head from the neck, but Father wasn't moved. The difference was quantitative and therefore only a matter of degree. To him, it was a principle. Two minutes, in two minutes, my father could lead any argument or discussion around to being a principle. Uh, we have talked in um, U.S. history about Christianity, uh, Christians coming to our country, and not only are there Christians, but there are Papists, there are Methodists, there are Catholics, there are Lutherans, there are many different sects of Christianity, just as there are of Judaism, just as there are Buddhists, just as there are of uh, Muslims. So they are talking about other Christians and how they practice differently from them. So he said grace glaring across the table at an imaginary point where he placed God. And I always felt that God had the worst of it. My father couldn't begin a meal with something direct and ordinary like, Thank thee, O Lord, for thy daily bread and fruit of the harvest. Oh, no, 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 no. He had to embellish it. If there was no guest at the meal, God was always present. And tonight my father said sternly, We thank thee, O Lord, for the bread we eat. But we are also conscious of seed we have planted, of the hands that guided the plow and the back bent in toil. The ground is dry as dust, and I will take the liberty of asking for a little rain. I know that thou givest with one hand, and thou takest with the other. But sometimes it seems to me to go beyond the bounds of reason. Amen. He then turned to his soup. Granny lifted her head and stared at him and finally said, Moses? Yes, mother, she sighed. And we all began to eat. Yes, mother. Nothing, Granny said. Nothing at all. Whatever is on your mind, Mother, I would appreciate your coming out with it and saying it. Eat your soup, Moses, she sighed. He was inordinately fond of soup, and during the soup, he left conversation to the women and the children. I did not have much to say to Levi, being occupied with my own thoughts, some of them about Ruth Simmons, and also some thoughts about going to sea. If you had respectable kin in Boston, it was generally understood that one of the younger sons would go to sea and learn the trade. Since there was no better way to end up with a fine house and a wife in silks and laces and good imported furniture, as well as some standing in the community. I was not a younger son, but one day in Boston, Captain Ishmael Jameson, my uncle on my mother's side, had felt my muscles 
asked me a number of questions and finished by wondering how I would like to sign up with him as bottom junior on a voyage to the Indies. I was remembering this, contemplating it, and speculating on whether there weren't more interesting girls in the world than Ruth Simmons, whom I had seen at least every day of my life. I also kept in the back of my mind a picture of my father's rage if I came out with so much as a hint about going to sea. So again, U.S. history. We've talked about um, the port of Boston, uh, the Boston Tea Party. We've talked about the Boston Massacre. We've talked about uh, commerce coming into the colonies. Why do we have colonies? You have colonies to gather raw materials and to uh, increase your economic standing of the mother country, right? In this case, it's England. We talked about mercantilism. And that's what's happening, is that he's talking about, maybe I can get some adventure instead of staying in the same old town, looking at the same one pretty girl every single day. Maybe I can get out there in the world, and I can go to the Indies, and I can meet new people. At the same time, Mother and Granny talked about the quilt competition. There were those in the village who held any sort of competition was vain and sinful, and no better than another form of pride. Granny put out that it was pure nonsense that the acknowledgement that one person did something better than another was sinful. She made the best and most colorful quilts in town and had been quietly pumping for a competition for years. It's not for the sake of a prize or money, Granny said. I do suppose that if there was something to be won or gained, it might be likened to a form of gambling. What's this about gambling, my father demanded? He had finished his soup. If Sarah Livingston could win, not likely, since she can't sew three stitches straight, we'd have a contest. She being married to the elder, be sure of that, mother said. Gambling? Eat your supper, Granny told father. What is a turkey shoot but gambling and sin? What is the lottery they hold each year in Boston? And don't tell me that high church buys the tickets. Did I say that? I helped mother take the empty dishes off and bring, <clears throat> bring on the platters of meat cakes and potatoes and parsnips and boiled pudding. You are about to, Moses. What is all this talk about gambling? It's woman talk. Pass me your plate. It did me good to see Granny treating my father as if he was half grown. She has an instinct about when when he is preparing to bear down on me, and she figured that a little humility would lessen the blows. But he all but he also saw where the wind was blowing and didn't hesitate another minute. No sooner had he swallowed his first mouthful of donker than he had said to me, How big are you, Adam? Tall? How do you know other ways of being big? Or excuse me, do you know other ways of being big? I could have managed a cl clever answer to that one, but I saw the glint in his eyes and decided to accept the sameness of big and tall and not promote an argument. It has always been a wonder to me that anyone could work up a rancor toward anything while eating my mother's cooking. But when something was on father's mind, it couldn't wait. No, sir, I agreed. Then what is your height, Adam? My mother knew my father was, was most ominous when he indulged in innocent and obvious questions, and she pressed him to take more boiled pudding. He cut the ground from under her by accepting another helping. But Granny said, whatever is this, Moses? Uh, it can wait until the meal is over. Adam won't be any taller than he is right now. Levi was too silent and expectant. I began to get the drift of things. Let me decide that, Father said. And suppose you answer the question, Adam. He went on with the boiled pudding, and I decided that if we could get this all out while we were eating, it would be less painful to everyone. I told him very seriously that I stood somewhere between 23 and 24 hands, most likely closer to 24 since I was at least two inches taller than Ebenezer Colt, who claimed to, who claimed to have just topped 23. Tall as a man, my father nodded. Some men, I agreed, did not think it wise to add that I was taller than most. 
and uh, strong as a man, then one would think that a man's mind would go along with all that. Don't you think, Adam? Yes, sir, it appears to make sense. Only appears so, Adam? Father asked softly. Oh, um, have some donkers, Granny said. All this is going to interfere with your digestion. You know that, Moses. I asked Adam a question. Yes, sir, I nodded. How long is a man supposed to watch his son and wonder? Uh, I don't know, sir. Do you expect me to take you out and birch you? Uh, no, sir. I I'm a little large for that, I whispered. It wouldn't be dignified. It, it wouldn't do me any good. It, it, would it would get around. I'm not sparing you for the sake of your reputation among your cronies. I nodded. I know that, sir. Just as you know why I am angry? Yes, sir. Levi couldn't keep his mouth shut. My father accepted a donker from Granny and took a large bite of the boiled pudding. And I knew that the worst was over and that for in the moment I was saved. He had put punishment aside for the moment and would employ reason as his weapon. I don't know which made me feel worse, and the only compensation was some speculation on what I would do to Levi. My father must have read my mind because he said, I don't, you, I don't want you to turn this on Levi, Adam. He did what was right. Don't you agree with me? I nodded, not trusting myself to look at Levi, and my father now enjoying his food and digestion and the soft whip. Uh, and the soft whip hand he had established over me continued. Why am I angry, Adam? It is because you repeated some foolish, childish dog rule when you drew the water from the well. Hardly, a, uh, hardly, and I hate despise superstition, not because it's blasphemous, but because it's a display of ignorance. He let the food go as he warmed up to this. My father was a fine talker, and I guess he derived more pure pleasure from it than from any other habit. We are plain people, he continued, not poor, for we are blessed with more than a necessary share of the world's goods. We have a good house with good furniture, good food on our table, for which we thank the Lord in his mercy, but plain and thrifty people. Yet we, your mother, myself, my father, and my grandfather, we have always prided ourselves that we are, in a sense, the people of the book. My brothers and I were raised, and I make every effort to raise my own children, not as blackguards and loafers, not as soldiers or tavern sots, but as thoughtful and reasoning cre cre excuse me, creatures, men who honor the written word, who respect intelligent writing, and who, like the ancient philosophers, look upon argumentation and disputation as avenues towards the deepest truth. I am a farmer who tills the soil to earn a daily bread, but there are 300 and odd books in this house, well-thumbed, well-read, nor are my neighbors unlike me. This is why, Adam, we are what we are. We came to this land in the beginning because savagery and superstition were an abomination to us. And in the midst of a new savagery, we planted our own seed of culture and civilization. Do you understand me? He finished. Well, he may, but I don't, Granny put in decisively. And I could see that she had decided to take a bit in her teeth. To make a fuss like that over the foolishness of a 15-year-old boy just passes my understanding it does. Why, believe me, I never did see a man to sit in his own supper table and be faced with this kind of food, Sarah. Cooper puts down in front of you, Moses Cooper, and be that ill-tempered. Now, please, mother, don't stop me in the middle of a sentence, Moses Cooper. All right. <laughs> You're welcome, Autumn. I think we're going to stop there for the night. So we've got a young man living in colonial America, and he doesn't seem to be much different from you guys. He doesn't seem to be very different from, uh, I think, teenagers when I was a teenager. His parents are driving him a little bonkers. His parents are questioning what he believes in. I think that's maybe the job of parents, and I think it's the job of teenagers to question 
or at least maybe in a respectful way, question what people are telling them. That's natural, right? It's natural. Well, thanks for reading with me tonight, guys. Um, like I said, I want to spend some time reading and sharing, and I want to spend some time on current events. So I've been digging around today, and um, I, I think probably a lot of you are uh, listening to the news about the coronavirus, and I don't really want to talk so much about the virus as I want to talk about the future, you know, what comes next. And uh, one of the things that the government, our federal government, is talking about is, um, and very worried about, is the economy. So let me do a little bit of griping here, okay? Um, Florida did not close the beaches. Uh, the governor of Florida decided to leave the beaches open because the economy of Florida, he believes, would suffer greatly, right? We've got millions of people coming to the beaches of Florida to enjoy spring break. A lot of businesses down there probably uh, are solely established to make a ton of money for spring break. So uh, the government has to balance two things, right? Uh, if we don't let this happen, our economy is going to be hurt. People ultimately are going to suffer financially. We as a community, or at least down in Florida, will suffer economically for the foreseeable future. Uh, but now it seems pretty clear, I was reading on the news earlier, that um, uh, students or young people, college people already starting to leave Florida and they have become infected with the coronavirus. So I, I was very surprised to read that. But this is what's happening. It's happening on a state level. It's happening on a federal level uh, that our government is saying, what do we do, right? How do we head in the right direction? So here are some of the things that the federal government is doing or considering doing. So the Federal Reserve, which in United States history classes we're just about to talk about, uh, the Federal Reserve, yeah, a lot of people did go to the beaches, you're right. Um, they control interest rate rates for loans, at least um, – when it comes to, you know, larger loans, people borrowing money for uh, mortgages and things like that, right? So uh, what they want to do is, and what they are going to do is they are dropping all of their interest rates to 0%. Why? Well, if I was going to buy a house right now, let's say I was going to buy a new house. As a matter of fact, uh, I had already been talking to a roofing company about putting a new roof on my house. I might not need it right now, but I think probably within the next five years or so. So I had talked to the roofing company, the roofing company, the guy came out, took a look at the roof. They called me back and they said, Hey, listen, we want to talk to you about uh, the cost of the roof. And I said, listen, I'm going to stop you right there. I don't want to waste your time. I'm not going to do it right now. I, I, I can't do it right now. We've got bigger fish to fry, right? So for me right now, to dump ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars into a new roof for my house, it's going to involve me borrowing some money, right? Uh, I know everybody thinks that uh, you know teachers are stinking rich and and they've got a lot of money, but uh, I don't, and because uh, I've got two pain in the butt teenagers that I spend a lot of my money on. Uh, anyway. So uh, what the federal government and the Federal Reserve wants to do is they want to keep interest rates low right now because they don't want me making that decision. They want me borrowing money. They want that roofing company to get the job because that's going to keep a lot of workers in business right now, springtime. If you're a roofer, if you know somebody that works outdoor construction, right, they are excited. They're pricing out jobs. They've been pricing out jobs. They're ready to get to work. Um, so right now, because of what's going on, hey, am I going to have my job in the future? Hey, is my neighbor going to have their job? What's going on? When there's questions like that, people, um, you know, just don't want to make those big ticket um, purchases. So the Federal Reserve wants to keep interest rates low so that we go out and we buy more things. I saw today a commercial for, I believe it was Chevy. Chevy 
is dropping their interest rates. Chevy will let you pick out the car online right now and drive it to you. They're going to drop it off to you. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. So when the government and private companies make these decisions, they're doing it because they want that money to flow, right? Of course they want to make money, but the economy works best when money flows through the economy. And what the government is considering right doing right now is um, putting together what's called a stimulus package. So the government or the, excuse me, the, the economy is hurt. People are saying to themselves, well, maybe I shouldn't buy that car. Maybe I'm not going on vacation this summer. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Well, what this stimulus package is um, geared towards doing is, uh, at least this is what they're talking about right, right now. This has not been approved. This is being discussed by the president, by the head of the Federal Reserve, and right now they're debating it in Congress. Right now, the big holdup is in the Senate, okay? And we know that we have 50 states. Each state has two senators. We have 100 senators. The Senate right now is controlled by Republicans, right? But Democrats in the Senate are holding up this bill. And we'll get to that later. Uh, but what they're talking about doing is this, is that if in the year 2018, you made, as an American, less than $75,000. You are going to get a check for anywhere between $1,200 and $2,000. That's what they're discussing right now. It's not been approved. So uh, if you make more than $75,000, sorry. Uh, and I guess the smallest payout, depending on how much you make, uh, the smallest payout for people, uh, lower class people, um, would be, I believe, $600. Then they're also talking about married couples. Not only would you get a check per person, you would also get uh, money per dependent. So how many children you have. So there's, so, and, and I think that's up to two children. So there's some potential for people to, oh, uh, I was, <laughs> that's a good question, Mackenzie. Um, I stayed away from the debate team in school. Um, uh, but thank you for the compliment. Uh, so again, what, what the government wants that money in our hands so that I go to Maine, right? Right now I'm saying to myself, do I go to Maine this summer? The boys and I love going to Maine. We try to go every single, every single, um, you know, year, but who knows what's going to happen with the economy? Um, I've gotten three emails in the last two weeks from the guy that we rent the cabin from in Maine. He owns a whole bunch of cabins. And he says, listen, I'll drop the price for you. I need you to lock in. I need you to send me a, you know, a security deposit. I want you to come up to Maine this summer. So I still haven't made my, my decision yet. Um, but when that check comes in, that's what the government wants. We're going to give Americans money so that they can go on vacation, so that they can buy food, so that they can pay rent, so that they can do all those things that uh, they need They need to do. That's what the government wants us to do. So that sounds really good, right? Uh, give every taxpaying American that's made under $75,000 in the year 2018, because what they'll do is the government will look at IRS uh, they'll look at everybody that paid taxes in 2018. Everybody under $75,000 will get a check. The downside is where do we get that money, right? They're talking about this entire package to cost about $1.8 trillion. $1.8 trillion. So the Federal Reserve will do things and the federal government will do things like they will uh, buy bonds, right? They will float bonds. So somebody's going to come and buy a bond for so much amount of money, give us the cash. But in 20 years, that country is going to come back to us and say, hey, remember that bond that we bought, uh, you know, we, we, we bought from you during the coronavirus? Well, back then we bought it for $200 billion 
and you promised us in 20 years you'd give us back $600 billion. So that's the trade-off, right? Give Americans money now, get the money flowing through the economy to keep people in their houses, uh, to keep people in their jobs, to keep money flowing. But someday we've got to pay that money back, right? We can't just print money. We've all talked about this. You print money, you devalue money, and then money is worthless. So we've got to get the money from somewhere. Um, but that is being held up right now. And uh, there's a number of different reasons why. Part of the money is not just going to go to us. Part of the money would go to businesses. So the government wants to help small businesses, okay? Um, Autumn, one day you want to own uh, probably your own um, um, salon, right? Well, there's a lot of salons. There's a lot of bakeries. There's a lot of small businesses out there that are going to be hurt. And they want to be able to give money to those small businesses and help them. But they also want to borrow about $80 billion out of this $1.8 trillion to help out large corporations. And one of the reasons that the Democrats are not on, with, not on the side of this bill right now is because the, the Republicans aren't really setting regulations, uh, you know, saying, well, we're only going to give it to businesses that are, you know, that maybe had this happen to them. You know, they lost a certain amount of money or whatever. So the Democrats are basically kind of saying like, hey, we'll vote for this. We'll go for this. But we need you to uh, write some rules about who gets the money. So we'll see. One of the things that the government is worried about, as some economists have said, uh, unemployment can hit 13% at the height of all of this. So uh, during the Great Depression, we're talking about 25, about a quarter of our country, 25% unemployment. People that don't want to work or people, excuse me, that want to work aren't working, right? So unemployment, for those of you that don't know, is not 25% of all Americans aren't working. What an uh, unemployment figure is, is this. If, let's say, 100 people in the country want to work and two of those people can't find a job, well, then we're at 2% unemployment. It's more looking at the amount of people that want to work compared to the amount of people that actually are working, and that's how they get that percentage, okay? So for instance, the uh, example that I always would give is um, let's say that, um, uh, you know, um, a woman is pregnant, she's married, she decides, I'm going to take two years off of work. Okay, no problem. Unemployment does not go up. She is voluntarily, leave, voluntarily leaving the workforce. So we don't say that is um, uh, now a, a rise in unemployment. I hope that makes sense. So we'll see. Um, the other thing that I saw uh, about an hour ago is that Britain the prime minister of uh, Britain has now virtually locked down England. So basically what he is saying is that if you are in England, uh, you will own your own salon, uh, Autumn, and I will come there and I'll get, I'll get some platinum tips. You can, you can take care of my grays. Um, so in England, what they're instituting is this. You can go outside if you need food. If you need medicine, that's it. So they're doing a whole country lockdown. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. What else in the news? Uh, you know, one of the things that I was very disappointed to see is, and I, I think I think a lot of you guys will probably be disappointed um, with this as well, is uh, there's been a lot of lash out and hate against Asian Americans. Um, and the president today has come out and, and, and spoke out against that. And his briefing, I think it started at five o'clock. Um, and, and I agree with him. I think that that's something that, you know, we, we I would hope that we know better, right? Um one of the interesting things where I live, um, the Chinese restaurant has actually closed down. And I was wondering if maybe they had been receiving a little bit of hate. 
Um, but uh, hate crimes in New York State, the Attorney General has started a hotline for anyone who has been the victim of hate crimes um, in the state. Do you think school will be closed for longer? I'm not too sure, Sydney. I think I think we're going to be out for a while. Some good news, though. I don't want to just talk about bad, stressful stuff. Uh, oh, recession. That's let me let me just talk about that word recession, uh, and then we'll move on to some good stuff. So you've probably heard that in the news. We might be headed into a recession. Well, what a recession is is basically this, right? When when we look at unemployment numbers, when we look at business growth, when we look at GDP, we look at all those things, we look at it on a quarterly basis. So that means we look at it every three months, right? Um, so we say, well, uh, uh, unemployment dropped to 0.3% uh, last quarter. They're talking about the last three months. A recession uh, is when, this is how economists, um, when they say we are in a recession. This is what they mean. For for two quarters, things have dropped, meaning that people are spending less money, businesses are hiring less people, businesses are making less stuff, and, and the economy is not growing. Um, the economy doesn't every quarter grow 30%, right? People like a little bit of growth, two, three percent every single quarter. They're they're happy with that. Um, you know, people are confident in the economy. So, um, you know, maybe when end of summer comes around, we've been through this for a couple quarters. We might say recession, but typically we need to see the economy take a downward slope for about a six month period. So you'll probably hear that word kicked around a little bit more. So some good stuff. Uh, I, I'll tell you, I've been seeing a lot of awesome volunteerism. Uh, Vladimir Putin set lions out on the street. Mackenzie, I don't know what you're talking about, but maybe. I didn't see that in the news. That'd be pretty cool. Lions on the streets, I guess that'd be cool. Uh, but anyways, volunteerism is up. Right, people are trying to help other people. Uh, where I live, small town, about three thousand people. There are a lot of people getting on Facebook and they're saying, "Hey, listen, if you're an older person, you're worried about the coronavirus, um, call me, uh, send me a text on Facebook. I'll come and I'll shovel your walk. I'll shovel your driveway. I'll go pick you up milk." Um, the pharmacy in town is now doing f free delivery to seniors. Uh, there are a couple different organizations, the Rotary Club, right? Rotary is a, typically every town, village, city has a Rotary. It's a group of, uh, it's an organization of people that all they do all the time is raise money and donate that money to different groups in their community. So for instance, uh, everybody knows I talk about scouting. We're scouts. Uh, our Rotary here in Middleburg, we do a lot of work with them. And every year they usually give us a couple hundred dollars to help send us to the Boy Scout camp or, or this year we're trying to do a trip to Washington, D.C. So volunteerism, as much as it can be, is up. And there's a lot of personal volunteerism. You know, people are just trying one by one. I've seen a lot of my friends on Facebook um, that have sewing skills, right? A skill that is go, going by the wayside. That is a long lost uh, skill. Uh, people are sewing masks washing them, giving them to people. Uh, I don't think our medical professionals can use those masks. Um, but if you want to go to the store, if you want to go to the, you know, stewards or, or you need to go out for some reason, having one of those masks um, would certainly benefit you. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, we've talked, well, of course, in U.S. history, we've talked about philanthropists, right? We've talked about um, people like John D. Rockefeller. Uh, we've talked about today, Bill Gates. Uh, one of my favorite philanthropists, not one of my favorite musical performers, but one of my favorite philanthropists is uh, John Bon Jovi. Uh, and John Bon Jovi had, you know, the, the best and tightest spandex of any other uh, hair band of the 80s. And I'm sure you guys have probably heard, uh, you know, a bunch of Bon Jovi songs. But, you know, he has spent a, a, a lot of his adult life uh, 
uh, helping people, helping veterans. And there's been a lot of really cool stuff on social media lately uh, with him. He's been in his uh, one of his restaurants in New Jersey, I believe, is just to help veterans. Um, or, or maybe I'm sorry, it, it's, it's, I think to help needy people, but he hires veterans. Uh, he's been in there every night washing dishes, right? So it, it's just not people like us, but there's a lot of great people that are, are out there, um, that are, they could sit at home, uh, you know, in their big houses with their big bank accounts and do nothing, uh, but they're not, they're out there helping. So, uh, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, so kudos to John Bon Jovi. Maybe everybody go and buy a Bon Jovi on, song on iTunes tonight. Um, the other thing, though, that I was, I need a drink, a little sip of ginger ale. The other thing, um, I, you know, I've kind of got mixed feelings about this. Um, I am not a big Gal Gadot fan. She is the actress that um, I think she was like in a bunch of those Fast and Furious movies or something. Um, but she's Wonder Woman now, right? And she made this, she called a bunch of her friends, uh, her celebrity friends, and she had been inspired in Italy. Uh, Saturday in Italy, 793 people died of the coronavirus Saturday alone. So in one day, and I think that was the worst day in Italy, 793 people died. Um, she was inspired because she saw videos of people in Italy, what they're doing at night, because they've been quarantined for a while, right? And I don't know if you guys have seen these videos, uh, but they've been opening up their windows. And because they can't go outside, they've been singing songs to one another and singing songs with one another. And she and uh, I don't know, maybe a couple dozen, maybe 20 of her celebrity friends all sang Imagine and they mixed it together. And, um, you know, they put it out there for the world to see and, and to inspire the world and try to help people through it. But I'm very surprised. I've seen a lot of people say that um, they think she's just doing it as a um, some kind of publicity stunt. And it's really just to kind of get more popularity. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I guess I don't know that I really feel that. Um I think she probably is probably is a person that, that helps a lot of other people. It seems like she she's that type of person to want to go out and do something like this. So, you know, I guess I'm a little mixed. I understand that sometimes people just need something to complain about. Uh, and maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe people are just jealous that she beat them to it. Uh, but I do see a lot of good people that are reaching out and helping other people in, in little ways. And I think that probably you guys are cooped up in your houses and you're probably sick of your siblings. You're probably sick of um, mom and dad, or maybe just mom or dad or the dog or the cat or whatever it is. Um, maybe, you know, try to do some little things, try not to do a big thing. You know, I, I've really felt like overwhelmed the past few days like, how the heck do I take everything that I've been doing for so long? Um, and every year I try to make it new and I try to make it fresh. But how do I totally, completely change what I do? And, uh, you know, this morning I got up and I've been really, I've been trying to tell you guys and I've been telling my sons, like, I think the one thing about what we're going through right, right now, it's very important that we keep ourselves physically active and we get physical exercise, but we also get mental exercise. Um, and this morning I thought, you know, I've got so much work to do. I just got to get on this computer and go. And I said, no, let me get outside. Let me just walk. So I walked, you know, a couple miles today and uh, got home. I did a bunch of chores. And then I got on the computer and I thought, you know, let me just take this one little thing at a time. I, I got all this stuff to do. Well, let me focus on the pig stuff. Then let me focus on honors pig. Then let me focus on U.S. history. Uh, and now that I've got the ball rolling, I can just chunk things up little by little. And I think that's probably some of you guys are overwhelmed like every single time somebody puts something on Google Classroom, bam, an alert goes to my phone or bam, an alert goes to my email. So when you look at your email, there's 87, you know, different notifications from just Google Classroom from chemistry class or something like that. Um, 
I don't know. You know, try that. Try to focus on the little. Let me do this one little thing. And um, don't try to do it all at once. It's it's not possible. It's not possible to do it. So, well, anyways, my friends, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, how long this is last. This is going to last, but it is snowing out, Sydney. You're right, it is. Um, but I'm going to be here every night. I'm going to do my best. Hopefully, I won't fall asleep in my my chair like I do most nights, whether I'm reading or watching television. But I'm going to be here every night. We'll continue to read and we'll continue to talk current events. I'm glad to see that so many of you showed up. Share with your friends. Anybody can come and excuse me that you know has any kind of interest and hang out with us. So thanks for being here with me on the first night and I'll see everybody tomorrow night. Miss you guys. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye.